Uh, thanks everybody, this is the Overcast Light Brigade. Uh, people in Madison will know Patty Lowell well uh, from, uh, she's a celebrity. Uh, she's also written actually many uh, books of, about Native American history in Wisconsin and elsewhere. And in, in Wisconsin, we love Patty Lowell. <laughs> introduction of all time. <laughs> but I have the great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker. Winona LaDuke is a white earth Anishinaabe Kwe and one of the most influential native activists in the country. She's the founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project and Honor the Earth. Winona has authored half a dozen books including The Militarization of Indian Country, Recovering the Sacred, and all our relations, Native struggles for land and life. A graduate of Harvard University and Antioch College, her academic research focused on rural economic development. She's the recipient of a number of national awards, including the Anne Bancroft Award for Women's Leadership, which she used to create the White Earth Land Recovery Project. Some of you may know that White Earth lost nearly all of its land through the allotment process. Her project, which is one of the largest reservation-based nonprofit organizations in the country, has as its goal the restoration of the tribe's spiritual and cultural wealth and the land. And so far, 1,400 acres of spiritually and culturally significant lands like Sugarbush and, um, and ceremonial grounds has been returned. In 1994, Time Magazine chose her as one of its, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing. In 1994, Time Magazine chose her as one of its 50 most promising young leaders, and boy, were they right. Three years later, Ms. Magazine named her Woman of the Year. She's been collecting accolades ever since. Yet Winona is humble in her celebrity and very generous with her time, lending her support and networks to environmental and social justice issues like this one. She is a mother, having raised six children and dozens of young people call her grandmother. Before she takes the podium, we are going to show you a video called Honor the Earth, Triple Crown of Pipelines. This was part of the horse ride for Mother Earth. So we'll show the film and then uh, Winona will speak. I have to do this because I'm not... Uh, sometimes I wish that women were born with eight arms like those. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get a lot more multitasking done and all that stuff. Do the best I can. Uh, uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you today. I was here a little bit earlier and uh, visited with some fine young women in another room for a little while, but uh, I'm just really glad to see some of the people of courage and forethought and, and uh, good thinking here today. So uh, let's see what we can do with our minds, bring our minds together so we can do good things for our people and for all those things that can't speak. Because there's a lot of things that can't speak. And uh, they count on us, you know, to do the right thing. I have to tell you a little funny story as my segue. The last time I believe I was in Madison, I was in warm. I can't remember it was warm though, and it was <laughs> that was a long time ago when it was warm, huh? <laughs> it wasn't this last year, I think it was the year before, no, a few years ago. I probably was here since then, but anyway, just quick story. It was really hot and I was really tired. It happens, you know? And so I went out and I grabbed a piece of grass by the student union. I can't remember, but it was, turned out that it was in the front lawn of the fraternity. <laughs> so I went to sleep and I was laying on the grass in the front lawn of the fraternity, right? And these guys came out and they thought I was homeless. <laughs> and they're like, lady, you gotta move. <laughs> so I said to you, and I was like, oh, I'm just tired. I just take a little nap here. I gotta go in there and give a little talk, you know? And they're like, well, lady, no, you gotta move out of here. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, you know, I'm old enough to be your mom. <laughs> and all those guys, you know, 
<laughs> so I just want to say that because uh, that's what it's like being a Native woman in Wisconsin or Native woman in Minnesota. You're kind of invisible and they think you're homeless. <laughs> Yeah, you know? mm. I want to point that out because I've got, got a few things to work on here if we're going to get out of this together. <laughs> I'd like to keep my home, but I just don't want any oil in it. That's what I'm thinking, you know? So I got a couple of things I was uh, thinking about here. Uh, you know, first I want to say I got a number of people that I'm working with that, that came here. Uh, Alyssa, it's like someplace I've lost her already. <laughs> this is Alyssa from Iowa. Hollis here, thinking back in the red hair. He's really, really tall with red hair. And then, uh, you know, I, there, everyone all can come out with me. And then Carrie, uh, she's here on the floor. She's doing some photography. We're doing a film, a uh, movie called The Black Snake about our struggle against a sandpiper. That's so what she's filming here. So everybody act good. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, there's some good people that come. My friend Paul Blackburn come over from Minnesota. And uh, uh, I was really happy to see uh, Kathy and Andy talking early earlier some really good work from our territory so thank you guys for you know for the fact that we get to work together in this moment this time which is a really important time to be in and then i want to say uh, where did bob go i have one of my board members here he is like hi there he is this is bob goff he's on the board of honor the earth And uh, I did leave all six of those children and 17 grandchildren or however many claim me this week home. <laughs> That's next time. So, you know, I think about where we are and we have this moment to do the right thing, which is what we're all talking about here. We're in this, like, you know, I feel like we're in this sacred moment. We have this opportunity to keep the planet from combusting itself to oblivion. Right. We have an opportunity from keeping them from putting oil in all the water. Yes. You know, things that we cannot pronounce throughout the soil. We have this chance to do the right thing and make, make a life that is good for our children and our grandchildren. And it is the time, for, it is our time. It is the time to take that. And we have to have the courage to do that. That's what we have to have. Because there's not somebody else who's going to do it, it is us. And so remember that and find that courage in your heart. I know that there are a lot of people that are working on this everywhere, you know. I say that, you know, first I want to say that a long time ago we had these prophets that came to our people. And a lot of you know this, you've heard me say this, and a lot of other Anishinaabe people. Those prophets came to us and they talked about this time now and they referred to it as the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, they said you're going to have a choice between two paths. The one path will be well-worn, but it will be scorched. The other path will not be well-worn and it will be green. And it will be our choice upon which path to embark. And that's what those prophets told those Anishinaabe people a really, really long time ago. And I know that that is the path that we are on now. And I think that that is a path that actually we're collectively on as all people that are living here. you got a choice between paths, you know? And that it is our choice. One is well scorched, and we see what that looks like. We've been talking about it all day. And we also see a path that is not that, that is where you have local food that is organic. That you do not transport things so far around that you have energy efficiency, that you treat people and the natural world with respect. That's a totally different path. And it is incumbent upon us to be the people that say that's the path that we're going to take, you know? So I think about it. We have a... You know, uh, in Minnesota, we, uh, you know, we, in our territory, Anishinaabe, I can, you know, I don't like calling this the Midwest. I just have to say, can, can we think about that term? I think this is the Great Lakes. Yes. 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 that is present here, not some geography that is made up by somebody. I don't know what the mid of what West is. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's never made any sense to me, and it's not going to make any sense to me because it makes no sense. You know? We're geographically situated around the Great Lakes, and we have a of the world's water. And that is why we're here, and that is what we have to protect. You know, in our thinking, we have this saying in our territory, which is love, water, not oil. Yes. Love, water, not oil. You've got a choice between the two, and that choice is no. You know, you can live with one, and you can and you cannot live with without it. That is true. You know, you cannot live without water. We all know that. So that is this moment that we're in, and we have to do the right thing to keep that. You know, to keep all that is ours. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about what I've seen. I was listening to Andy talk earlier, and I was really proud of you, Andy. You know, thanks for that. I really like seeing these young people get up there and say these things. You know. I'm old enough to be Andy's mom. You know, he doesn't start calling me auntie when knowing it, but a lot of people his age do. You know, that's all right. That's good. I'm, I'm happy to see that. You know, I want to say Andy's a little bit like perhaps I am. I, was, I travel around. I like to stay home. I'm from, you know, northwestern Minnesota, my, my territory, White Earth Reservation, my Round Lake where I live. It's funny, they said that the last 
the last Indian war in Minnesota was on Round Lake, and I say, we ain't done yet. <laughs> I'm from Wellman. Um, but, uh, you know, what I, what I want to say is that I think I've become a, you know, we have to be bards. I don't know, I was, y'all y'all see that movie, A Knight's Tale? Okay, I watched A Knight's Tale. You know that guy who shows up, he's all naked at the beginning? He's like kind of confused. He has, great, he has a great story though, but he like starts telling these stories of what people have done. You know, and in a way, that's what we're doing with our social media. That is what we must do here and we must do to each other. So we must tell stories of what is going on on all these pack trails, you know? And uh, I think it was uh, my colleague Carrie there, she asked me to say something like, if people are tweeters, I don't know what tweeting is. I mean, I just have a basic <laughs> idea. But she, she wants to see if people can tweet love water, not oil. Is that what she said? And take a picture? I don't know, I don't know. Just either way, tweet love water, not oil, just to see what that is. Is that right? It just helps everybody find each other on the issues. Okay, she says that helps everybody find each other in the issue. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> but you know, some people are those people that do that, so please do that. <laughs> it didn't really last, the last century person. <laughs> but this is what I want to say, you know, is in being a bit of a bard. That's what I decided, I feel like, but you know, I got more clothes than that one guy did in that movie. But, you know, you go along and you, and you have this opportunity to see people along the route and to see what is going on. And I want to tell you what I saw because I've been to the, in many ways to the beginning and to the end of what these black snakes look like, you know. And that's what we call this in our territory. We call this the black snake. And there are prophecies in our territory and prophecies in Lakota country and in Anishinaabe country about the coming of the black snake. And what I'll tell you is, is that in our prophecies and, you know, in our ceremonies, I went to a lot of ceremonies on this and I, and I asked, like, what, what, what are we supposed to do, you know, there? Ask some spirits on some of those things. And you know what the spirit said to me? The spirit said, there's a reason it's in the ground. <laughs> there's a reason these things are in the ground. And we have to remember that because we live in a society which feels entitled to take things that should be in the ground and take them out. Yeah. And we need to challenge that paradigm because that paradigm is not sustainable. You cannot keep taking things out of the ground and expect that to work out for your water or for your land or for the things that we don't understand about how Mother Earth lives. There's a reason that copper is in the ground. There's a reason that oil is in the ground. There's a reason that carbon is supposed to stay in the soil and not go in the air. Right? Those are the things we know. And we have to really challenge this paradigm that says you keep taking things out and it's going to work out. Right? Because that's not true. You kind of keep taking things out. But to keep that in mind, because a lot of us, I think we end up in this era now where I see a lot of people going, wait, I just want to stop this one thing or stop this one thing, you know? Or like, wait, you know, I mean, my impersonation of Minnesota politicians is like this. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's coming our way. Let us do this. <laughs> That's really not a strategy. <laughs> you know, it's time to grow up, you know? So we've entered this era of extreme extraction. And I think you guys probably been talking about that. I did not spend all day talking about it. But what I'm saying is, is this, we've entered this era where we have taken so much from Mother Earth that anything we take now is, is not taken, given to us willingly. You know, extreme extraction is when you take off the top of 500 mountain tops and Appalachia. You know, and you blow off the top and you call it mountain top removal. Extreme extraction is when you drill 20,000 feet under the ocean to take out some oil that should be staying down there, and then you have a problem like Deepwater Horizon, and you go, oh, sorry, I'm not going to mess that one up, right? Extreme extraction is the tar sands, and extreme extraction is fracking. Fracking yeah. is rape of Mother Earth. That is what fracking is. There is no other way to describe what is occurring with fracking. When you take the frac sand that I just saw, we just drove by there, we were over in Winona, my other, my, my hometown there in Minnesota, you know, down in that whole area in southern Wisconsin, what you call Wisconsin and Ho-Chunk territory is what I would call it. In that territory, they're taking that sand, and you all know that. They're taking that sand, they're putting it on trains, and they're loading it, and then they're taking it out there, and then they are taking these, these engines, and they're putting together, and they are, they are taking those chemicals. They're taking 600 chemicals they do not have to disclose, and they're taking that sand, and they're taking it down, and they're exploding the bedrock of Mother Earth. That is what fracking is. That is how extreme it is. It is extreme rape of Mother Earth. That is what is occurring in fracking. And yet what happens is that because it happens in places like North Dakota where people do not go. <laughs> and they're like, well, I'm hoping that's going to work out. You know, This is me, even in Minnesota, until a few years ago. I was like, man, that looks kind of bad. I'm hoping that's going to work out in North Dakota. I'm hoping that's going to work out. 
you know, there's two things I'd say about that. One thing is, is it's, you know, it's a lot like the analogy I think of is a lot like when you know that there's a child being sexually abused in a, in a household that is near yours or in your extended family and you're looking at that child and saying, that's a bad thing, I think that's happening over there and I hope that works out. Yeah. That's what this is like. That's what this is like. And it's not going Hi, this is Sherry Jones, and I'm with Mary Beth Elliott, and Mary Beth is going to tell us about her organization that she's working with here. Lots of different things going on. In our particular fight with uh, Enbridge Line 61 uh, in Dane County, uh, Enbridge Line 61 throughout Wisconsin is expected to carry 1.2 million barrels of uh, tar sands oil uh, per day, 1.2 million, and that's a lot bigger than the Keystone is proposed to be, except very few people have heard of it. So one of the things that our organization is doing, 350 Madison, is doing everything we can to make sure that that is actually a safe thing, because we're very concerned about previous bills that Enbridge Company has had in the U.S. Okay, do you have a a website? Yep. Yes, we do. In fact, if you just Google 350 Madison, you'll come up on our website and it'll talk about our tar sands program. Um, what we have been doing is working with Dane County um, to uh, request a conditional use permit for Enbridge to be able to expand its pumping station in Dane County. And without that one expansion, um, the pump pumping power can't really increase to 1.2 million barrels a day. We want Enbridge to get sufficient insurance. We feel they're way underinsured and the citizens and taxpayers of Dane County will be left holding the bag if there's a terrible oil spill that will ruin farms and property and homes and wetlands. And so that's been our major emphasis for this year. Although 350 Madison is a climate change group, we don't want the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere to be greater than 350 parts per million, or there will be very severe consequences for humanity and the world, and it's already up to 390 as far as I remember. I could be a little bit wrong on that number, but it's already above 350. Will it, um, will it ruin the wells too? Um, well, we're very concerned about any groundwater, if there are mm -hmm. ever any uh, pipeline spills. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is, too, that sometimes there are leaks that are undetected, and there can be a lot of chemicals, a lot of oil even, that seeps into groundwater without people realizing it. And in addition, many people don't realize that tar sands, tar sands are not like regular, regular crude oil that people pump and it spews out of the ground. Mm -hmm. It's a very heavy clay-like substance that they have to, to dilute with toxic chemicals such as benzene in order to even get it to move through the pipeline and they heat it up as well. So when this, when a pipeline ruptures, you have benzene and all these other organic chemicals getting into the air, basically poisoning people. There were 320 people sickened when there was a tar sand spill in Michigan in the Kalamazoo River. And tar sands is what Enbridge Line 61 is carrying through Wisconsin and through Dane County. So we're quite concerned about that. And we've been pretty successful this year in being able to uh, not let that permit go through until Enbridge has proved that it can actually protect the citizens of Dane County financially if there were to be such an accident. It sounds to me like things could get burned, like animals and insects, things with the, the chemicals. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, these uh, chemicals as well are cancer-causing as well as birth defect causing. Benzene is a known teratogen, that is birth defects, and a known carcinogen causes cancer. I'm a PhD in pharmacology myself, so I have a particular interest in the health risks of these things. 
Um, and that's a yeah. huge concern. People get sick from these, and no one can say that even a short or an acute exposure might not have some long-term deleterious effects. Uh, certainly the spills are dangerous to wildlife, to vegetation. Um, it's a terrible thing. And a large concern is that tar sands sink to the bottom of the waterway. So it's not like it floats and you can skim it off. It sinks to the bottom and can almost never be really effectively cleaned up. And in the Kalamazoo River, the tar sands sank and it's not even 100% cleaned up yet, even after $1.2 billion has been spent for that. Sounds like it's pretty heavy. It is. It It'll be is, hard it, to get out. It's hard to get out. And like I say, the dilutants, the things they dilute it with, the toxic chemicals, are very concerning as well. The companies used to say that this is proprietary. We won't tell you what our dilutant is. But in fact, we did get Enbridge to tell us what is the list of all the dilutants. And it includes benzene, as has been suspected, along with a lot of other toxic chemicals. So there are threats on so many different levels. The threat to people, land, water, from an oil spill, uh, the, the risk of these toxic dilutants, but as well, the boreal forest in Canada is being destroyed by tar sands mining. They take a whole part of, they take uh, forests, get rid of them, get rid of the topsoil, they leave toxic tailing ponds with caustic liquid in it where ducks fly in and all and die. Hundreds of thousands of waterfowl are being killed in, out, in Canada because people are digging for these tar sands and then they ship them through these pipelines. So it's, it's bad. And then of course when we use tar sands as fossil fuel to run everything instead of renewables, that's bad for the climate as well. Do you know what happens to the, um, the animals that, that, and birds that aren't born yet after they're born, after a, a female has has been um, exposed to it, say, and she has babies in her. Uh, what birth well, effects will lot, happen? A lot of different things can happen. It depends on on the chemical, but um, there are some kinds of chemicals that are called endocrine disruptors, and it just means that they have they can have effects like the estrogen hormone, which is normally it's a normal horm hormone in women, and it's present to a teeny bit in male animals as well. But when you have chemicals that kind of mimic that and act like like hormones, sometimes they can cause very bad effects, birth defects and other problems. And even aside from that issue, uh, oil is directly toxic to animals. We've all seen you know, oil-covered birds and it would decrease reproductive rates. The other thing it does is to uh, disrupt flight paths if you have, um, uh, if on the eastern flyway or the uh, there's also a, a, a prevalent uh, flyway in the middle of the country when birds are migrating it can be very dangerous if the places they're used to landing and being able to, to eat so they can make the rest of their trip yeah but this is ruined so there's just lots of danger all up and down the line and there are many beautiful birds that migrate from Canada to the US and back that are being absolutely slaughtered it is a it is an ecological sacrifice zone in Canada. I had seen some ducks a few years back uh, and they were their beaks were deformed, their feet were deformed and I wondered what happened here? What happened to these birds? And and the only thing I could think of is something toxic like this. Yeah. And the fact is you know, dinosaurs died millions of yeah. years ago and we all know that that's why you've got these fossil fuels in the ground, and that's where they should stay, regardless of whether you're using a train or a pipeline. Leave those fossil fuels in the ground because every time you bring them up, they're going to go into the atmosphere and it causes, it causes global warming. Something else that people don't understand is that even if, aside from the warming, fossil fuels, CO2 in the atmosphere makes the ocean acidic. So that's mm -hmm. why uh, many coral reefs are dissolving, and many of our oceans now are becoming jellyfied. Jellyfish are taking over many, many of the beaches in the world. 
you have different fish uh, with global warming and with mm -hmm. acidification of the ocean. So there's so many different ways that fossil fuels that are brought out of the ground in whatever way, whether it's coal or, uh, or, or, or crude oil, are harmful yeah, for the environment as a whole. How can people get a hold of this petition to find out more about it or to sign it? Facebook. Okay. Facebook? They can go to Facebook. Face, Facebook. Uh, basically, if you Google on uh, divestment or fossil divestment or... Uh, Would be, uh, was it on the 350 website? Yes, if they, yeah. have, okay. if they, if they okay. go to 350 Madison, right. they will have a link there. Okay. Yeah, or 350madison.org, or okay. Facebook 350Madison, and okay. they will have a link to UW's. Uh, okay. And petitions to get them to divest. Okay. And you are? I'm Kermit Hovey. I'm, among other things, a volunteer at 350madison.org. Okay. And I'm Dave Davis. I'm uh, kind of a remote member of 350 Madison. We live in Illinois. Okay. I'm Sherry Jones. Thank you.